Listen, gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? The new year starts in Materials podcast hosted by Mike Turek, Emily Yates, Kelsey Coons, and Gerard Cuomo. All are current EMS providers and educators with a combined 30 years experience. Each month we discuss EMS news, medical science, and review actual EMS calls, bringing many educational opportunities to the listener. Portions of the calls have been altered to protect the privacy and identity of all involved. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, back to the Medic Materials Podcast. Kelsey, you were dancing I was through dancing. the new I intro. I feel like this is a good vibe. Yeah, I that's like I like it. Good year. See? The, I was uh, just waiting for Ramstein to kick in. <laughs> 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 I mean, the, the countdown was for just this episode. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to surprise you guys with the, uh, the new theme song. I figured we, we had the old one for like yeah. a year and a half. So you yeah. throw in a little bit of new vibes. Yeah, during the post-COVID era. There you go. There, there you go. go. Yeah, and right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel it, man. That's funny. Yeah, That's Emily, funny. How's, how's that shaking out for you? <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, so, yeah, we're, uh, we're here, as always, with paramedic intern Kelsey, Gerard, and uh, Emily, you are going to be joining us via Skype today. So uh, mm -hmm. hopefully your sound doesn't cut in and out. We've had very good luck with the Skype. Uh, through the new soundboard. But, uh, yeah, I want to wish everybody a, uh, a happy 2022. Yeah. So it'll be, a, it'll be a very interesting interesting year. And, and to start off the year, um, I wanted to have a discussion about a, I, I feel, a topic that needs <laughs> chatting about. It, like, there, it's a, there's... There's unpopular opinions about it. There's positive opinions about it. And I think this is ultimately going to be a masterclass on this, this specific drug after we're done. Um, so I will leave you hanging on what drug it is. Kelsey, let's do your first rig check of the year, and then we'll get into it. So, guys, we have recently changed our email address. So for any questions, comments, or feedback you have about the show, please email us at info.medicmaterials at gmail.com. We are especially asking that you send in any cool or interesting calls that you've done for us to review on the show. So again, you can email the, us those calls that are new email. Make sure you rate and review the podcast on whatever streaming platform you listen from. And we're also just a quick reminder that if you do want to support Medic Materials by doing more than you've listened to now, which we are super thankful for, um, you can buy Medic Materials merch or use our Leatherman par partnership by using the link tree in the description below. And today we want to shout our listeners in Key West and Romania. And yes, Key West is a part of Florida. <laughs> yeah, <to> Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael. Hey, no, no, no. Is the Key West part of Florida? Yeah. No, it's, she it's, can... it's part of Cuba. <laughs> she confused me. I thought we when wanted Key said, West and a state. No, it is a state. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to our newest Patreon listener, Phil. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's been re-annexed re by Spain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So um, today I want to have kind of the unpopular discussion about ketamine and its uses. I think you should have a dun 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 sound. No, no I, honestly, I think, you know, the conversation is significantly overdue. You know, we use ketamine on a fairly regular basis, you know, in our area. Um, you know, our area is also tracking ketamine and, you know, there's, 
there's the whole press about ketamine in the news. There's a lot of places that are looking at it as this, you know, horrible, horrific, um, you know, drug that EMS now gives. And um, that's just not the case. I think, you know, we're going to touch base on some of the criminal cases that are out there. Um, not in, sup- you know, super detail, but, you know, it's one of those things where I think certain bad eggs have ruined it for the entire bunch. And I want to get your guys' kind of opinions on, you know, on ketamine. We're going to go over what ketamine actually is. And I pulled up a significant portion of ketamine history. So the first thing that I kind of want to ask you guys is how old do you think ketamine is? Well, are you talking Seven. about in a clinical practice or just, like how long it's been around? Just how long has ketamine been around? 100 years. That's a it long didn't, time. It didn't come into the clinical practice until know. the 60s, though, right? So, of course, Emily would know. Emily would know. I'm That's very why I, was like, I didn't know we were having this discussion today because I would have my little ketamine drug card. Yeah, they used to mix it in Coca Cola and we'd have it with our jazz cigarettes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, that was just Coke. <laughs> Just cocaine. Yeah, that's <laughs> why Coke was so good. <laughs> <laughs> Catch the wave. Oh, wow. Um, Nobody's going to get that one. <laughs> probably not. Holy shit. That one went I'm over already my lost. head. So yeah, that was, uh, that was their slogan. Long Who's time slogan? ago in a galaxy far from Coca-Cola. Really? Yes, catch the wave. Google, Coke. Google this. Huh? Do you know? Yeah. Wait, time out. Back thing. to ketamine. Do you know where they first started uh, researching ketamine and like where they first brought it into clinical practice? I I'm gonna read it, but you can tell us. Oh, never mind. No, okay. no, 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 no. What, uh, no, so no, no. Go, 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 go ahead. I don't want to ruin your Detroit, thunder. Michigan. Yes. Ooh. Detroit in Michigan. the '60s, right? What is it? The '50s or the '60s? So it does look like he's high on ketamine. So it actually started. Oh, look at that. It does look like he's high end. <laughs> we'll Down be the forwarding cable. you the um, photo, Emily. That's, that's Max Headroom. <laughs> <laughs> wow, how I know that. So, uh, so yeah, it actually, uh, the, the, the actual history started in the 50s. Um, it mm, didn't I start tried. getting clinical use until the 60s. Um, and, uh, and then FDA uh, approved it in the 70s. So, that it, it's... It's not interesting. It's not as old as, you know, it's not as old as 100 years, but yeah. it's been around for a long time. This isn't something yeah. that was developed in the 80s or 90s and, you know, right. we're just kind of, you know, using it now, you know. It's it's fallen in and out of popularity depending on what time frame you're going through. So, um what is ketamine, right? So, I love Kelsey when you're doing drug cards, use this website, drugbank.com. It's amazing. Um They say that ketamine is a rapid-acting general anesthetic producing anesthetic state characterized by profound analgesia, right? Um, Did you just have a stroke? Did you get it? That just, wow. My my head's still trying to swim around that one. Oh, just wait. Where did you lose it? Rapid? Just wait. I I had you at ketamine is. (laughs) A rapid-acting anesthetic. Let's just put. Okay. We'll just simplify it to that. Right. Uh, characterized by profound analgesia, normal pharyngeal, laryngeal reflexes, uh, normal oh or God. slightly enhanced skeletal muscle tone, cardiovascular and respiratory stimulation. So that's good. And occasionally transient and minimal respiratory depression. So. Um, the uh, the anesthetic state uh, produced has been termed the disassociative anesthesia. We'll actually get into what they originally wanted to call it, which I think is hilarious. Um, it's not the K-hole, is it? No, okay. no, no, no. Uh, I honestly think it's better than the K-hole. Ooh. <laughs> um, and uh, it appears to significantly interrupt association pathways of the brain before producing uh, somesthetic sensory blockade. So... For all of the people that actually like the uh, the chemical bullshit about how it works, this is well above my head. But like it's I said, it, bullshit. oh no, it's bullshit because I don't fucking understand it. It doesn't make I'm, it I'm bullshit. Just gonna, I'm just gonna stop you right there. And what I'm, uh, we we need to we need to give props. You made it through all that without destroying not a single <laughs> fucking word. Oh yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Uh, when I get through the history. Oh, okay. I won't. Right. <laughs> I will not. Um, so ketamine interacts with the N-methyl D-aspirate 
receptors, opiate receptors, and um, the monoaminogenergic receptors. Woo! I actually got through that one. Um, <laughs> See, that's where that Ric Flair sound effect would have come in. <laughs> right? Um, and uh, unlike other general anesthetic agents, ketamine does not act uh, does not interact with the GABA receptors. Um, well, that's fun. Yeah. So the uh, this is this is good just for EMS as a whole, especially if you have long transport times. The half life is 186 minutes. So, um, and ju- not a minute more, and not a minute more. <laughs> nope, 186. That's it. On the dot. Not 185, 186. Correct. Um, just as a as a refresher, because we're going to be using these terms interchangeably uh, throughout the throughout the episode. Analgesic is again medication acting to relieve pain, whereas anesthetic is a medication that produces local or general loss of sensation, pain, paralysis, amnesia, and unconsciousness. So, um, I want to go for some of that. Yeah, right. K hole. There you go. Right. Um, Complete amnesia. There you go. So here's where I'm going to get into the history because I feel like ketamine is so. Um, Everyone goes, oh, it's a, you know, it's a dissociative. It takes your mind and it throws it in the left field. And that's all you ever know about it. You don't know how it works. You don't know how it was developed. You don't know the history on it. So I feel like a lot of people, especially doctors, and you and I are going to talk about that mm-hmm. uh, in, the ke- you know, in the whole idea of ketamine denial in the hospitals. I think a lot of people are afraid of it because they don't really know what the heck it is. So it's, isn't it, hold on, let me try and guess this because I feel like I've had this conversation before. Yeah. Isn't it a clinical indication or it's a clinical, um, they brought it on in vet medicine starting, but isn't it an alternative for PCP? So Emily, you've done your homework. Um, so yes, I it's, have researched ketamine. So, so, uh, <laughs> as I'm going to read, it's actually a, uh, a compound derivative of PCP. Um, yeah. So as you, as you already said, the, the history of ketamine began in the 1950s, uh, at a lab called Park and Davis and company, uh, in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, at that point in time, Park and Davis were searching among my first fuck up cyclohexlamines (laughs) for an ideal anesthetic agent with analgesic properties. I had no idea what the fuck that was. So I researched what the heck a cyclohexlamine is. And it's a colorless liquid amine that is used in the um, synth- uh, in organic synthesis to prevent corrosion inside of boilers. So, gee, I want that in my body. Exactly, that's exactly <laughs> what I was saying. They're like, yeah, let's. That's the 1950s for you. Mm. All right, right, let's take this poison and make a medication right. out of it. Right? Why not? So on the uh, on the 26th of March 1956, a chemist discovered a process which led to the symph- synthesis of uh, phenecyclidine or PCP. Um, Park and Davis psycho- uh, far- yeah. Pharm- <laughs> pharmacologist. I'm impressed you made it that long. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well done. Um, so Park and Davis. This might be a new record. Yeah. Right. Um, Park and Davis uh, pharmacologist Dr. Chen received the PCP compound on the 11th of September 1958. Uh, Chen and a Dr. Domino began to study the experimental effects of the drug. <laughs> this is from a James Bond movie or something. I, dude, I, seriously, it was... I could not have written this out of my imagination better. Uh, Dr. Chen, like, Dr. Domino. Exactly, like... You're just you're you expect just, me to talk. Exactly. You're just waiting for, <laughs> for something bad to happen, right? So these two just doctors <laughs> uh, began to study the experimental effects of the drug on animals. Uh, phenecyclidine created potent analgesia in animals to the point that laparotomies or a surgical incision into the abdominal cavity uh, were performed. Time in out. A cavity. cavity. A cavity. Did I say cavity? I believe he's. I believe he's. I believe he's. <laughs> he's speaking in the old English. Cavity. I was. I was channeling my yes. inner. Uh, sh- you know. As we approach the cavity. <laughs> you. You had Conry in my head. Right. I was. I yes, was. Inner- yes, I did. Yes, you were. I was channeling my inner Sean. Yes, we went into cavity. <laughs> I'll take cavity for two hundred, Alex. 
So uh, these uh, the PCP created the uh, the potent analgesia in animals to the point where the laparotomies, which are surgical incisions into the abdominal cavity, uh, were performed <laughs> in monkeys without signs of pain. So they continued. Parkin Davis investigated the potential of this PCP as a human anesthetic under the trade name Cernil. In 58, 1958, the first human trials of PCP were published by uh, a Dr. Griffinstein, um, who, yeah, you can't, you can't make you this just, up. Come on. <laughs> so this, uh, this Dr. Griffinstein uh, decided in testing the surgical incision they tested it in 30 patients of his. So, uh, are we sure it's Steen and not Stein? I don't know. Like Frankenstein? Who knows? Couldn't tell you. Okay. Don't know. Uh, I don't just want to be accurate here. Yep. You know, no when, we're de- when we're dealing with like all these totally you know made up freaking James Bond names, <laughs> I want to make sure we're accurate. <laughs> so the uh, the complete operation of the surgical incision could be performed under the uh, the cernil uh, alone. Under the what? The cer- the th- whatever the PCP drug is. Oh. Cernal, Cernil. Cernil. The only drug you have to refer to by sir. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm going to say it's Cernil. See we'll, that right we'll there? just go there. That right like, there's the advertisement like right there. Cernil. There you go. There yep. you go. So, yep. uh, however, the Cernil was unsac- unsatisfactory <laughs> for surgery in 13 of the 30 patients. Five of those suffered severe excitation. Ten of the patients were unmanageable in the post-operative period and had some um, very prolonged recovery times of like three to 18 hours. So ultimately, they published these clinical uh, their clinical experience in a British journal of anesthesia in 59. Um, and it stated that Cernel was da- undoubtedly the most potent general anal- analgesic agent which had ever been used in clinical medicine. Um, it had the unique advantage over other sedatives and analgesics that it did not cause depression of cardiovascular or respiratory function, nor depression of the pharyngeal and laryngeal reflexes, and could be used safely in elderly patients. However, the usefulness of the drug was limited by the excitation, um, which sometimes persisted for more than 12 hours after a single dose. So with growing you know, clinical knowledge and data, it became clear that the PCP was not really all that suitable for human anesthesia. So, fun yeah. name. But, uh, you know, bikers found uses for it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, another great name, Dr. Cal Bratton, uh, head of pharmaceutical research at Park and Davis, promoted further synthesis of related compounds in a hope of reducing PCP side effects. Another doctor, uh, Dr. Stevens, was a chemical consultant to Park and Davis. Uh, he was a professor of organic chem at, um, at a college in Detroit. Stevens then decided to synthesis a unique series of PCP derivatives in his lab. One of these agents synthesized in 1962, produced excellent anesthesia, and was short-acting. Um, Let him have it. All right, I'll just give it to him. What? Anesthesia. You said anesthesia. Oh, I'm sorry. I it, guess, this I, is I a lot. I, I guess it only puts your butt to sleep. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I you, to you all right, it. please. Do you think that I've gotten this far? <laughs> like, I might have taken ketamine to get through all, all this, right, all right? <laughs> so. <laughs> I was wondering why you were drooling. <laughs> so, um, this compound produced excellent anesthesia and was short acting. It was uh, selected for human trials as uh, CI581, and because it was a ketone mixed together with an amine, it was named ketamine. Surprisingly, oh. McCarthy described it in 1965 as being a compound with uh, cataleptic, uh, which is just la- lack of response to external stimuli, analgesic, and anesthetic. I'll hit that one. <laughs> and you know what I wanted to say. Action but without the hypnotic properties. So we can say that it was developed in 62. Um, the first human, this is going to, you're going to love this Gerard, because 
This is right up your alley. Right. The first human admin was conducted by Corson and Domino. Remember Domino? Yes, of course. Um, Who could forget? Yep. That summer in uh, you know Ibiza. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On, on the third of August, <laughs> here, 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 on the third of August in 1964, to volunteer prisoners ah. at the Jackson Prison in the state of Michigan. Of course, they were volunteers. <laughs> right. Every single one of them. Every single That's one right. of them. So the incidence of adverse effects was one in three. Corson and Domino observed the patients describe their feeling of floating in outer space and having no feeling in their limbs. Domino published the first clinical studies in 1965. They had a good deal of discussion, in quotes, um, about how they would publish the data. The term schizomimetic mm. would probably have, this is what they're saying, would probably have uh, nipped in the bud the future of the new molecule. And the three researchers were about to coin the term dreaming to describe the, pe uh, the peculiar anesthetic state. Uh, when fortunately, as Domino spoke to his wife, Tori, um, she then said and suggested the term disassociative anesthetic. Um, so ketamine finally was characterized as a dissociative and was later described as, um, as having the electrophysiological, thank you, I got that one out, mm -hmm. and yeah. functional disassoci disassociation between um, the thalma cortical and the limbic system. So you pretty much your brain and your limbic system. Um, and this is where, uh, Emily, you said it started in vet, or, uh, vet medicine, right? Veterinary medicine. Um, yeah. that was actually not in the United States. It was in Belgium. So ketamine Belgium. began as a vet anesthetic when it was patented in Belgium in 1963, uh, mm -hmm. after being patented by Parkin Davis for human and animal use in 1966, Ketamine became available by prescription in 69 in the form of ketamine hydrochloride under the name uh, Ketalar, which I think is what we still use today. Um, yeah. It was officially approved for human consumption in the U.S. by the, F, uh, by the FDA in 1970, and because of its sympathomimetic properties and its uh, wide margin of safety, was administered as a field anesthetic to soldiers during the Vietnam War to replace morphine. Um, Concerns over the so-called uh, psychedelic effects of ketamine and the arrival of two, uh, of, no, I'm sorry, not two, of the new intravenous hypnotics such as propofol prompted a market decrease um, in the use of ketamine in the affluent world. I love that. Um, such jerks. The affluent world. Right, because... Yeah. Apparently, we're affluent. Nobody else is. It's stupid. So, uh, ketamine mm, abuse... Yes, I find it to be uh, shallow and pedantic. Yeah, yes. right? So, ketamine abuse appeared during the Vietnam War, shockingly, and uh, on the east coast of the U.S. and increased from 1970 onwards following the publication of two books, Journeys into the Bright World and The Scientist, uh, which both put forward the author's psychedelic um, experiences. Because of this abuse, ketamine was placed among the class three scheduled substances of the, uh, of the U.S. government in 1999. And today, ketamine interest continues, right? Its value and safety um, has been you know, noted in, and demonstrated in thousands of patients. After more than 50 years, ketamine makes a true clinical comeback into, again, the affluent world. Um, but however, in the less affluent world since the Vietnam War 40 years ago, uh, it has remained uh, a crucial sole anesthetic agent enabling surgery to be performed where without uh, nothing would be possible. So there is your history of how ketamine actually got to our doors today utilizing an EMS. Um, it's got a long outstanding history, but yeah, it was developed off of PCP, which I think is like, I didn't know that. That was really interesting. When I yeah. read it, I was like, oh, shit. That's interesting. Sure. Um, but it makes so much sense. Right. It does make so much sense. Like, you know, especially knowing, you know, how PCP, you know, creates that euphoric, oh, I'm going to go see pink elephants everywhere. And that's, you know, you give enough ketamine, you're, you know, people say, oh, I saw pink dragons. You know, I was in the K-hole, whatever. You know, so you can kind of see the similarities. I mean, the only difference is they don't take off all of their clothes and, you know, fight the police. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So, you know, in, in your guys' opinions, you know, 
when are you going to utilize ketamine um, in the EMS setting? Like you and I have used it a lot, Gerard. Emily, I'm intrigued to hear your version of when do they use it, if they use it in the ER and the hospital setting. As so we well. use it a lot in the hospital for pediatric, um, like conscious sedation. Uh, that's like the first line that we go to is ketamine. You see it a lot, you know, same as pre-hospital. You see it a lot for like excited delirium type patients or like uh, in induction for RSI, um, things like that. We use it a lot more than we do. <clears throat> I should say we use a lot more post intubation than we do in the hospital than we do pre-hospitally. I feel like pre-hospitally, we kind of give it for induction and then don't really give it again. Um, but the hospital is a little reverse. So, I mean, it's a lot of the same similarities, but we use it a lot for pediatrics. Which is interesting because um, I don't know your experience with the, you know, with ketamine and peds, Gerard, but mm -hmm. I've only ever give ketamine to one pediatric patient in my career. And that was, you know, beg, borrow and steal to get the doctor to even agree to that. Yeah. You know, no, I think I, that I, you settle with have. ketamine in general, though. I mean, yeah. And, and that, that I know that's something that, that Gerard really wants to touch base on. Um, so I'm going to let him go down the rabbit hole mm, of, uh, of ketamine denial. There, yeah. there you go. So I'm going to let you go and, and offer that opinion. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, it's in our protocols, you know, we don't have to call for it for excited delirium. We don't have to call for it you know, to use as an induction agent and, uh, ongoing sedation for uh, RSI, but you know, to do what it's actually meant to do is, you know, take away pain. We have to call for it. So, you call and, you know, oh, I don't know, let's just say, and I'm just spitballing here, you know, for a spontaneous pneumo patient, right, mm -hmm. where we want to kind of, you know, keep them breathing, you know, don't really want to mess with, you know, any of their body, body systems, right? So, uh, yeah, you know, you call for ketamine. Oh, yeah, no, 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 just give them fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. And then you call for other, you know, injuries, you know, pain management, stuff like that. No, no, just give them fentanyl. Right, even you know, yeah. I've called and been denied for femur fractures yeah, I'm, and I'm, you know, um, all sorts of different kind of you yeah. know things that are pain related. You know, um, heck, I've called f the, the one time that I was shocked and appalled that I even got it was for abdomen pain. Mm -hmm. You know, they they gave it for just a generic abdo yeah. pain, and I was like, what? Like, I was shocked, yeah. figuring, oh, I'm gonna call for this. I'm wasting my time. They're not gonna do it. And then boom, they were like, yeah. It's like what? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't even call for it. Any, I, I don't call anymore for it. Yeah, I, I just it's just, you know you're not going to get it, so just but, don't even bother. But that's the thing, like you know, now there's that culture, and I'd be very intrigued to see what everyone else's experiences are with ketamine. Um, every every time that I upload a episode, there are Facebook and Instagram posts for the episode, so go on there and and comment under under this post. I want to hear what your protocol is and use for ketamine. Um, but then I also want to know if you've been denied um, and in what circumstances have you guys been denied for ketamine? Because I think it's a really, you know, interesting, is it just New York in our area or is it everywhere? Right. You know? So um, interesting enough and worth mentioning is nurses do not give ketamine in a hospital. That has to be given by a provider. Right. So and, and I, I want how much that transpires to when you guys are calling and they're like hey we want to give ketamine and they're thinking like what the fuck like how are you guys giving ketamine absolutely not you can give x y or z and this is right where, and and what we were talking about earlier where you know it doesn't seem like the physicians we are supposed to be calling you know have any clue as to what the fuck we do Right. They're, they are not in touch with EMS at all. Yeah. Our capabilities, the meds we carry, nothing. But yet these are the doctors that we're calling to get orders to do things. But I also think that that's something that you could play to your effect. Because one of the things is, you know, when you're calling for orders, I was just on a call with a paramedic that I don't work with very often, and they called my home hospital for orders. And I happen to know the doc, and I respect him a lot, and they would not give orders for ketamine. And my thing to them was, A, call back and let me talk to them. Or B, call back and say X, Y, Z. They're already on end title. You know, we already have X, Y, and Z covered if, you know, any of these side effects happen. I feel like 
when the majority of people that are calling for orders are not setting a good picture. So I can agree with that. But do you think that there is a lot like the hesitancy in uh, in the doctor's eyes is that we don't know how to utilize ketamine and they're scared of that? Or do you I feel like of, if you have ever seen ketamine given in an ER, pediatrics, adults, whatever you're giving it for, with the exception of like, oh, we're going to RSI this guy because he's about to die. There is a long process to get things ready. You have to have the end title there. Respiratory has to be there. The bag has to be connected to oxygen and on. Like, there's a whole checklist, mm -hmm. regardless of what you're giving it for. The other thing that I think is a little iffy, and on the call that I'm talking about where we were calling my home hospital, they had asked for um, 2.5 of Versed to calm this patient down, and it was for an extremity fracture, and then they were going to get ketamine to take the pain away. That right there is conscious sedation. Yes. Yeah. So and I mean, that, even even our local protocol says, you know, you're you are if you're giving Versed and then you're following it with ketamine, there is a huge blurb of warning right, right in right. our protocol. Like, uh, yeah, be smarter than that. And that's something not even just ketamine. Like you're giving Versed and fentanyl or Versed and morphine. Like that's still a conscious sedation. Right. So it's something that like. When you're calling and you're saying this, and like, oh, yeah, well, I want ketamine for pain, and you just described a conscious sedation, like, how much faith do you have that – do you think that doctor's going to have in you? Well, and that's true, and that's – and, that you know, I agree that I think EMS, uh, you know, pushes itself into a corner, but at the same point, you know, there are providers out there that can – produce a good picture and knows, you know, okay, I need, I need SPO2. I need oxygen. I need an end title. I have all this done. I have my right. blood pressures running at every five or three minutes, you know, and I'm prepared for what ketamine could possibly do in the respiratory depression and sedation, you know, aspects of it. And the doctor still is like, you suck. Yeah. Jackass. And, and then they say, no, you know, yeah. Um, and you know, I <laughs> like how I slid down in that. That was great. <laughs> the timing um, was perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I've called doctors and, you know, asked for something as simple as, you know, tortle. Yeah. And, well, and, you know, they're like, yep, give half a dose or whatever. And then, I, and I'm like, cool, thanks. It's something. It's not what I asked for, but it's something. And I get to the ER and they're like, we didn't even know that you carried Toradol. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. right. thanks. Why are, I mean, you, why are you a doctor that can give me orders? Right. Yeah, that's a huge issue. And I'm sure that's across the board. I don't think that's just New York. You know, you're constantly cycling, especially in the emergency room. There's such a high turnover for providers that you're constantly cycling these providers in and out. And, like, who's really educating them on our protocols? Right. So and why was... are those that we're calling? Right, and that was a big discussion that you and I had last night, Gerard, in mm. that, you know, where is the education for the doctors that, you know, shows them our capabilities and our protocols? Because, what? you know, like they've, I've called, you know, brand new docs. And in our area, you know, every March we get the, you know, the brand new the season hatchlings. Of, of hatchlings, yeah. you know, the baby docs. And they automatically get to be medical directors. Yeah, no. Boom, there you go. And they're asking me if I carry insulin and can I give this? And I'm like, Doc, I asked for bicarb for a reason because no, that's what I got. But that's all I got. Like, but that's but that's the problem is you know I can't tell you how many times now it's like you call up and they have this I don't know mindset of that it's a hospital setting. Yes. Yeah, and it's like no, no. I I need the low presser order just in case because I have a forty minute effing transport. Right. And if the you know if the blood pressure does spike, I'd like to take it the fuck down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and I don't have service for three quarters right. of the drive. So please, you know, pretty please with sugar on top. Can I get the fucking order, please? God damn. <laughs> I feel like also, and I've learned this specifically just in my clinical time, like literally just this. Um, past week when I was in clinical, we were talking about it, and the nurse flat out looked at us, and they were like, yeah, like, we redo everything because we don't trust a single thing that comes out of any of your mouths. So as the doctor who's now putting his license on the line, he's trusting you, and based on the hospital atmosphere, half the time they don't trust a single thing that we bring in. Right, which, I mean, there's there's a huge disconnect as well. 
you you also have to look at it though like do you trust every provider Turk or Gerard that you're getting a report from BLS first responder anything like that like you're they I, I do until proven otherwise yeah they gear EMS and all our protocols all our skills all that stuff based on the lowest provider right. and that carries through all the way because we allow that to we as an as a profession we are okay with mediocre work and we accept that and this is part of the issue with with accepting mediocre work yes i mean i i've, I've seen nurses that are pretty mediocre as well too but, but even you know, still you know it, it seems like it's across the board I'm, you know? there's there's but, there's always bad people in every profession yeah. right but 100%. But I will agree with Emily that that is literally the whole reason as to why all of this that we're doing started was because EMS, we've always said, we suck for a reason because we we don't take low people, like not strong providers, and bring them up. We let them be shitty because and then we, it's easier. We don't want to invest in education, you know? Training. Training. Anything like that, cater to that low provider. So the one that is really excelling and exactly what we do want in our profession is punished for it because they're putting all this work in for nothing. And they're like, oh well, if I can get away with doing nothing, why aren't I? Right. right. And then or they lower. Yep, you always have to lower the bar. And, you know, and that's why I always say that we don't deserve anything that everybody wants to say that we deserve because we don't deserve it. Until we prove that the culture has changed then we can deserve better things. Um, and you you brought up that, like, nursing has bad apples, too, 100%. But at the end of the day, nursing has the education to back it. They have the training to back it. You know what I'm saying? So it's just different. It when is, a, when yes. a nurse, it's also different because they're right there. And I'm talking ER nursing. Like, I'm not talking floor where the docs, you know, sleeping in the on-call room or whatever. In the ER, I'm going to go and I'm going to do whatever they ask me to do. And then I'm going to communicate with them, but I'm right there. You guys are 40 minutes away asking for ketamine. And then you call back in 10 minutes and you're like, oh, by the way, they're dead now. Like my bad. They can't assess that. They can't do anything with that. They're just like, okay, we'll see you in 30 minutes. Right. Blindly trusting you. And right. Right. Not much to throw trust at. Yep. I'm I'm not disagreeing. I think, like I said, this was going to be a very interesting conversation that we were going to have today because these are all issues that EMS as a whole has to deal with, right? right. We're, right. you know, you look at all of the news out on ketamine, you look in our region alone, uh, you know, here where we all practice and the doctors are taking a scrutinous look at every mm-hmm. single ketamine admin in the region. No matter what it's for, mm-hmm. delirium, pain, sedation, RSI, it doesn't matter. They are looking at it with a fine-tooth comb. And they're making sure that people have done their due diligence. Is the protocol followed? Is there end title? Is there waveform? Is there SPO2 with waveform? You know, how did they, how did they, you know, give it? How did the patient seem to react to it? They're looking at everything. And I think a lot of that is because of the bad juju that it's getting in the news right now. They don't want to be caught with their pants down. But again, I think that comes a lot from trust. And I don't think it's a bad thing, especially when you're dealing with a drug like ketamine. I don't think ha- going with that fine tooth comb and making sure that, you know, hey, you didn't do this right. So for the next time, you can. Right. Is a, b- bleh, is a bad thing. Well, I don't really know where that word went. <laughs> but that goes back to the whole thing. Like- in EMS, everybody thinks that, like, criti- constructive criticism and, like, QI, it's all punitive. Like, I love getting flags on my charts. Please right. flag me. Nothing. It's not punitive. It's an educational thing. Right. I want to know what I did this time so that I can do it next time. Right. And I don't think a lot of people really look at, like you said, they look at it as punitive because, well, I'm the best. Why? How dare you flag my chart? It's good. Yeah. You know? And that's the, oh ma- and that's the mindset that we need to get rid of you need to be open-minded and be like listen i don't know everything i'm not good at everything you know i do have holes in my game where that i can learn and grow um so you know getting back to the the whole use of ketamine right so we we in ems use it for everything that gerard stated right rsi induction sedation um whether it be excited delirium or post intubation sedation and and for pain control right i think most of us use it for induction, sedation, 
than we do pain. Um, you know, in our area, we have, you know, standing orders for morphine and fentanyl. Um, so ketamine is kind of the, the last ditch effort. Um, unless, you know, you're like, Hey, I think this patient could really use it. And then you call and they're like, no, give fentanyl or whatever. Um, but you know, do you like Emily, you, you kind of alluded to something that I wanted to talk about in the RSI setting. Most people, uh, that you're seeing are using ketamine for induction, but not the post intubation sedation. And why do you oh. think that is? Because I use it for both. Yeah, that's what I do. I, I, I think it's amazing for both. Yeah. And I honestly think like you're getting the pain relief and you're getting the the sedative properties of it. So why wouldn't you use it? Right, for it's two days? for one. Yeah. Right. You, there's no there's no switching. You know. Oh, I'm gonna give Versed. Then I'm gonna give fentanyl. Then I'm gonna give Versed. And then right. I'm gonna give fentanyl. And then oh look, I'm out of Versed. Now what? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, like. My favorite post RSI sedation is fentanyl versus. I think it's easy to manage. I think most people do really well on it. Absolute favorite, hands down. However, if I'm inducing with ketamine, you bet your damn ass I'm using it for post sedation. Yeah, yeah, and it's, and it's, it, you know, I, I don't, I don't ever like to go. Well, it's easier route, but it really is, right? You get all right. You're you're inducing with. A sedative that also has pain control for the intubation, so that's perfect, right? So why wouldn't you just keep utilizing the same drug? And really, it goes off of weight, so you're not going to run out, you know? Right. You're not giving 250 every single right. time that you're right. you know wanting to sedate somebody. And we carry 1,000. I've never used 500 of this stuff. Yeah, like we, had, we had one where it was... Uh over 30 minute transport time. And I think shit, we only when we were using the one bottle, the yeah. one vial, and then there was still crap. We had to waste. Right. So, yeah. And that's, so and that's it. because there's an agency that we all know that, uh, had a three hour wait at an ER with an intubated patient. Wow. Which is insane. Insane. That's a whole, but, that's a whole other podcast on its own. A hundred percent. But there will be a time when you will use all of that. Can Right. You know, and, 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 you know, there have been in the ER and ask for yeah, more. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, that's when you're banging on ER doors going, I'm just going to bring in my patient. Sorry, screw you. I'm standing in an empty room because there was no bed in the room. How yeah. pathetic is that? Like, ridiculous. But, yeah. but yeah, I think, you know, the I, – I recently did an RSI um, where the first provider, you know, w- was – we were talking about meds and um, it was a respiratory patient and um, they were like, Oh, you know, what about Atomidate and sucks? And I was like, what about ketamine and sucks? Why, why and, does everyone go to Atomidate and sucks? What is the reasoning? You know, the reason, you know, the reasoning. I know. the reason. Don't even say it. <laughs> Just don't say it. I'm it's already- easy to <laughs> dose. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that, that, I think we're all ingrained to do Atomidate and Sucks. Like, you know, you look at, I've been a part of many RSI classes and all they preach is Atomidate and Sucks. There's no Atomidate and Rock. There's no Ketamine and Rock. There's no, you know, Versed and, you know, Sucks. There's no, you know, delineation from Atomidate and Sucks. Because it's easy to dose. They're the first lines. They can be utilized for most everybody. You know, they're easy on, you know, they're easy on, easy off. And I feel like most agencies are going to the lowest common denominator. So people don't have to think about things. Whereas, you know, in this case, I wanted to use ketamine because we can utilize it for the whole, the whole time. So there's my easy dosing. I can use the same med and just switch dosings. And... It's a respiratory patient, so I'm going to get some bronchodilation out of that ketamine as a side effect, and I want that in a respiratory patient, right. yeah. you know? Yeah. Anybody else have anything? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm right with you on that. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, it was Kelly it was just speaking. Would you, would you, would you yeah, like Kelly was, would you we like stepped over oh, Kelly. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, Kelly, sorry. <laughs> sorry. My bad. It's just a long, awkward pause, and she didn't uh, have her mic. I, I muted, I muted Emily's mic, so Kelly was talking. And 
We just couldn't hear. Her. Just couldn't hear. Her. <laughs> yeah. It was very odd. It seems to happen every time. Yeah. Well, you know, she's very soft spoken. Right. <laughs> um, but you know, is there so? Is there a, a a place where you're not going to use ketamine, Gerard? Um. Coping. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, any Sorry. kind of a, anything where I think there's going to be a rise in intracranial pressure, things like that, I'm probably not going to go that route. Uh, I wouldn't even consider it. Yeah. Um, but, I mean. Uh, now, how about, oh, okay, so what if, you know, there's, because uh, this, you know, this was a story that I got um, from another provider. You know, they're, they're somewhat hypertensive, you know, 160, 165, maybe 170. And they're looking to either sedate or RSI. I mean, that's not hypertensive, but you're going to get that catecholamine yeah, right, dump. Right. So you're going to get the you're go up a the, bit. the bump in yeah. pressure. You know, hopefully with with ketamine, if you still have catecholamines right. I mean, available. You got to take the whole picture into consideration. I mean, you know, is this person normally hypertensive? Right. You know, I mean, if, if they are, well, then all right, no big deal. All right, yeah. Give them a little bit, and you know. It'll, but I mean, if this is a result of some kind of trauma, then right? Fuck Head out. injury, be, not. right? <laughs> or a stroke, or right, you know, yeah. you're suspecting a bleed or something like that. Right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I definitely, I agree. There's not too many contraindications for ketamine. It's not like sucks where you know, God forbid, if you don't go through all 15 of them, you <laughs> might fuck something up. Right. But uh, ketamine, really, you know, increased ICP head injuries and. You know, if somehow they're allergic to ketamine and can tell right. you because they're not unconscious, right. you know, <laughs> um, but what are, you know, experience wise? I have a question. You so can't. You I can't. Have a nope, 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 ah, nope. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so I have a question. If you had a, somebody who like had a PCP overdose and now was an excited delirium, but you didn't know that they... We're on PCP. You stuck him with ketamine. <laughs> Would you make it worse? No. At some point, you'd have a sedative effect. I mean, wh- what do you mean by worse? Are you going to make them more... <laughs> more PCP. Yeah, I think she's, <laughs> she's asking, are you going to make them more bonkers? <laughs> I don't think you make them more bonkers. I mean, I think you definitely have to watch their airway on that, but mm-hmm. yeah. I don't think you make them more... And, and honestly... Right, because, you know, knowing the history, I think it's a PCP derivative. It's not like you're giving them right, you're not giving more, them more PCP. PCP. It's just you're giving well, something that acts like it. I don't know, it could make like the PCP it. worse. It, I mean, it's totally possible. I guess it's plausible, but, I mean, if you, you know. If you somebody do it and let us know. <laughs> don't do oh. that. Don't do it. Well, if you've morphine, done it. If you give morphine and you're still in pain and then you give fentanyl, does that make their pain worse? No. But, like, you, you're going to have the side effect of it. At some point when you give ketamine, it, it's going to have the sedative effect. Okay. Yep. So, you know, I, I want to get into the, the, the drama of ketamine just a little bit. But before I do, I want to ask, you know, overall, have your experiences with ketamine been, you know, good, bad, or really indifferent? Have you seen a very, uh, you know, good outcomes with it, bad outcomes? I mean, personally, I've had very good outcomes. Uh, there was one that, uh, you know, started seeing the pink dragons, but that was about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, uh, you know. And well, they, were they still? And, and to, be, to be perfectly honest, I, I probably got my dosing wrong and yep. gave them a little, little more than you should have had. Yep. So that was not that was on me, not, not, know, not, not the drug. Right. Um, you know, because I suck. And uh, you suck, you jackass. See? Exactly. <laughs> and uh, but now for the most part, yeah, it's been great. In fact, the one I had uh, recently, like very recently, you know, it was somebody that became a, a danger to themselves and my uh, my partner, and uh, that was m- the best option I had to uh, to take him down and take him down quick. So yep. that's what I did, and it worked great. Yeah. Yep. And that's and that's again mostly what I've used. Uh, ketamine for I've used it more in RSI, but I have used it in sedation uh, purposes. But I mean, really, my my thought process is 
if I am going to sedate you with ketamine, I'm also going to RSI you afterwards. I'm not just going to sit there and be like, oh, look, I just, you know, like our protocol is 250 for excited delirium, right? 250 I am. And I'm pretty sure if you give me 250, I'd be dead. Right. So that's where I want to talk dosing in, you know, later on, because I think dosing is where we all go wrong. And, you know, yes, there's a blanket of 250, but I'm going to give Gerard and I size people 250. If I gave you or my wife, <laughs> you'd be dead. Right. You know, um, my wife looks at 250 and goes, what? Because she's never given that much on a helicopter ever. You know, so mm. I'm I'm curious at the doctor level why they're not going, okay, let's let's change the dose from these high retarded doses to more size appropriate weight based dosings um, because then you're, you're trusting them to get accurate weights well and that's so this was something that uh that i wanted to bring up because when i looked at the news and i'm not going to you know specifically comment on any one misuse of ketamine that's in the news right now um However, what I saw reading all of these articles and and the information that I could find on all of these is if there was a bad outcome, they either gave the drug out of protocol, the wrong dosing, or in one actually outside of the law for the for the EMS first responders. Um so Again, we go to that bad apple bunch in that all of these news stories are being caused by people, you know, giving ketamine and their protocol says 250, but they give them 300. Or it says you're not allowed to do it at this specific time. It is that specific time and they give it anyway. Um, or, you know, they're giving them like one of them was like 500. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. Why? Anybody. Right. You know, so it's like, I mean, as far as the weight based stuff, we all know that, I mean, we could solve that easily by just spending more time at the carnival. Well, that's, that's true. What I'm but, saying. You suck <laughs> at you being know. carnies. Well, you know, and, and it was, it was very annoying. And I told you this last night mm. when we were kind of talking about this, Gerard, in that one of the, uh, one of the, uh, states that is going against ketamine in EMS use for specific purposes uh, actually wrote within their legislation that two providers, two EMS providers needed to be on scene that were both trained in weight estimation. Yeah. So now, now, like, right, are, are, are the carnival people going to come in and be like, all right, step up. How much do you, th how much does this person weigh? Like. <laughs> dumbest thing I've ever heard. It yeah. is the dumbest thing you've ever heard. But there's a way to get around that. You know, like I want, I will pay extra. If I was ever an administrator, I would pay extra for stretchers that had weights built into them, ah, scales built oh into them. Oh my God. What a concept. Concept, right? You know what's going to happen? We're going to forget to zero out the scale because we suck. You, you're not wrong. Hey, you know what? You can also have it where it just automatically t does a tear weight. Yeah, but just... you know what? You'll be closer on that weight than you would if you guessed, I bet. That's true. Damn or skippy. And especially because we all know that we suck and that we use Atomidate and sucks. Why do we use Atomidate and sucks? Because everyone's a fucking 100 kilos. Right. My wife, 94 pounds, 100 kilos because she's an adult. Kelsey, 100 kilos because she's an adult. I'm actually 50 Gerard, even. 100 kilos because he's an adult. Oh, that's way off. <laughs> I'm actually 50. I ain't even going like to sleep. I'm like 50.3 <laughs> or something. But that's what I'm saying. Like, we do it to ourselves because we want things to be easy for ourselves. And then we wonder why the person, you know, was not sedated and we had to give them more. Well, probably because you underdose them. Right. Or why are they completely unresponsive and their heart rate's now 30 and I'm about to do CPR? Well, probably because you were like, oh, yeah, it's 100 kilos right. and they're 50 kilos because you're just a lazy sack of shit. So it's like, why aren't we producing methods that are going to ultimately help us out. Weight-based dosing is all of our RSI drugs. Yep. It should be our ketamine. It should be our 
uh, morphine and our fentanyl, right? All of these drugs are now going weight-based. How many drugs that you give in the ER um, that are all weight-based? A lot. A lot, right? But the thing is, too, people say, like, we're in an ambulance. We're, you know, this is do or die. You know, time is of the essence. Bullshit. When we have a patient that comes in that, like, needs to go to the cath lab emergently, do you know that I have to get them an actual weight so I can start their heparin before they go to the cath lab? Yeah. Like, it's, it's across the board. And that's the thing. Like, we're going to, we are going to lose this stuff. And here's the thing is it cheaper to say we're going to single dose ketamine versus saying anybody that carries ketamine needs to have a weight based stretcher? Yeah. That's yeah. why that hasn't happened. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, yeah, no, I know. Cheapest, easiest option. Right. As a whole. But they're catering to a lo- the lowest denominator. Right. Which, you know, again, I think is, is the common. Uh, flaw in our system is that we keep you you know keep diminishing our profession to the stupid and then you know and the it's is, high profile ketamine cases and like we're not bringing in specifics but if you look at any of them all of like there's one that has legal action taken against it were they ever educated on ketamine did that go through their qi process were they retrained like did they just automatically go to you know what i mean you don't wake up one day and be like i'm gonna kill this guy right but that opens up a huge thing for pre-hospital providers and the fact that like none of us are doing this on purpose so now you're doing something that you think is right or you you know i thought that that patient weighed xyz and i'm gonna dose him for that and you were wrong, and now you're going to get legal action taken against you. That's huge. That is huge. Yeah. You know, especially That's- because, again, like you said, they think they're doing something right, you know, and um, and there's we're no – Well, and there's no – you know, again, how are we supposed to guesstimate weight? We're not carnies. We don't have scales on our stretchers. Right. You know, right. even if we had just, you know, as you said, Gerard, a pad scale that we yeah. could throw on top of the pad – that gave us yeah. something, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, like, as a provider, I would be nervous in today's day to give ketamine. So that's a funny thing that you mentioned. I mean, especially since I'm in school right now, I mean, they give us, you know, the list of drugs, the list of uses you can use it for, but especially ketamine, like multiple instructors have been like, oh, you know, like I don't really use ketamine, especially with everything that's going on right now. And it seems like at a there's such a fear of it, Specifically because you don't want to lose your job over some pain management. Right. Which sucks for your patient. But at the end of the day, we're all humans. We all have a livelihood to make. And there have been a, there's some instructors that, you know, they're like, oh, I love ketamine, one of the greatest things ever. And then there's others that refuse to use it because of the bad name behind it right now. And it's not worth losing your career over because well, I mean, we suck at doing things. Yeah, I mean, uh, to, to be perfectly honest, I mean, let's, you know, really, uh, if you unless your patient can tell you what they weigh, then really it's crapshoot. Yeah. It's crapshoot. So maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe the, maybe none of that shit should be in there or there should be a line that stipulates that, you know, unless you're able to gain you an know, accurate weight, an accurate weight, then right. you, do, you don't do anything. I mean, it, it might be, but you know, I'm, I'm on the fence with this because I'm one of those people that, you know, even, even in today's day and age, I am not scared to utilize ketamine. Because, you know, I know that when I, like, when I did the RSI a couple weeks ago, I, the guy was, you know, semi, semi responsive, could not talk, could not give me an accurate weight. Right. And I went and instead of going, oh, he's a hundred kilos. I went to the family and was like, listen, do you know his weight? And she was like, yeah, he weighed himself like three days ago and he was, you know, this. And I was like, right. perfect. Awesome sauce. Yeah. Right. Do you get that on every single no, one? Don't. No. Right. Is there times where you have to go, okay, you know, they kind of look like the size of my wife. They kind of look like <laughs> the size of me. Right. And that's what we're doing now. Right? But should we be doing that? Probably not. Because I, I especially, agree. Especially if we're opened up to liability. And when you're doing that, why are you doing that by yourself? I well, want every it. single person on that scene to be like, how much do you think he weighs? Okay, how much do you think he weighs? Yep. How far off are we? Are right. we all in the same partner? You know what I mean? Right. When someone's saying 50 and the other one's saying 150, it, there's a problem. Right. Yep. Like, okay. Right. Then it needs to be a discussion. I think that we're just so willy-nilly like, oh, 100 kilos, here we go. And everybody is just on that page that nobody questions it. 
they would get your wife drug these 100 kilos and they would just give it and no question would be asked. And that's right. the issue with it. Yeah. And, and, and so because that's how we're taught and that's how we practice and there is no changing it. Right. And, and, you know, there is a, that's why I'm torn because I agree with Gerard in the fact that, you know, if we continue to make these dumb errors because this is just the way it is, yes, it should be taken away from us. You know, just like intubation. I mean, honestly, it I, should be fucking taken away it. from us. I wouldn't even say take it away. I, 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 I'd give it away. Yeah. You can have it. <laughs> Fuck it. You know, but then, but then, <laughs> but then how do we advance, you know, not just ketamine, but EMS as a whole? Because there's going to be those holdouts where you're like, listen, you can't use 100 kilos anymore because it you have to estimate real weight, you know? And people are just going to be like, no. Hundred kilos is easy to dose. But you that come with more things than just ketamine. Like right. that should be pretty of the of the drugs that we're giving right now. Right. And I think that you know, I think that you're gonna see things like ketamine and stuff like that get taken away because we can't do it. But in reality it's it doesn't fit your picture. We're taking steps back as a profession. We're not taking steps forward. So like yeah, we have a bigger issue here with training and you know, we need to start doing weights and all this stuff, and they're going to take it away with ketamine, and that's how we're going to get punished. Ketamine is a great tool if we can properly use it. Yeah. And we're going to keep using these tools that we have to help people because we are too lazy to retrain because we need to think about this totally different now. I mean, really, the step forward would be to, you know, technology, put the freaking, put some kind of a scale on this, the stretcher. Take human air. I agree. You know? How many times, how many, you know, airway classes or, you know, CMEs or whatever you've gone to that have talked about weight-based drugs? Not many. Not enough. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's it. You know, you look at, uh, you know, again, not to compare apples to oranges, but you look at when my wife flies, right? Yeah. Um, If they do an inner facility, they automatically ask, what was the weight that you guys have been utilizing? You know, exactly. what, what is the weight? Because we're going to do all of our drug calculations off of that weight because that's what you guys found on your stretcher, right. you know? And, yeah, right. scene calls are a little different. They are forced to do kind of the same thing that we are, you know, estimate weights. But they're taught that every weight is different. Nobody is exactly. just 100 kilos because it makes dosing exactly. easier. Um, exactly. You know, I and, mean, when and, you and, yeah, I, and you get triaged, I want to know, like, what allergies – my first three questions is what brings you in, are you allergic to anything, and what is your weight? That's right. the first three questions I ask him. I don't care if you are gasping for air. What brings you in? What do you – wait. But at the same point, she's right because what the hospital – <laughs> I'm a 100 uh, – uh, <laughs> but it's true. No, you know, like <laughs> – Oh, so toe pain. <laughs> Stand you up and walk to that scale? You know, I and and I know that um, you know, I'm sure this this show has not got a large enough audience that Stryker or Ferno or somebody in in an admin developing position is going to be listening. But if you are if you are, or if you know somebody in one of those mm-hmm. positions, advocate for, you know, these new tools. Because yeah. again, you know, we all sit there and we go, Oh, the Lucas was the greatest thing ever invented. Yeah, it is. You know, but if I could put a zeroing weight scale on my stretcher, yeah, I'm gonna buy it as an admin, one hundred percent. Do you, you, you can, remember email yeah, you know, and they're like, "Oh, you can't use it. It's not as good as small CPR. Like nobody works better than a human." Do you remember when that first came out? Yep, it was the same thing, and that's exactly where you're gonna get with any new technology. It costs money. It requires training. It's not worth it. Like, look at how well the Lucas does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, something that. Yeah, good. Did we lose her? I don't know. What? No, I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, I just needed. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to step My on COVID you. Throat. you know? Oh, her COVID throat. Oh, the co- oh COVID throat. COVID yeah, throat. That's, that's, that's She's a bad starting one. to break up again. I mean that that sounds like that sounds like a good porn title. Right. The COVID, COVID throat. throat. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> But no, I mean, so just disappointed. But I mean, just think about it. You know, if if we, I mean, I, I'm 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 looking at it from a lawyer. You know, you've got 
<laughs> I'd sue the Which fuck you're not. out of you. Well, I'm just saying, you know, you've got someone who says, hey, you know, you, you guesstimated the weight on my patient to be this. The patient was, you know, you're, you're my, my client was not that weight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, therefore you were liable for whatever the fuck just happened to them. Yeah. You know, so fuck you, pay me. Yeah. You know, and Which you're not wrong. Right, now. right. And that's the way it is right now. So, I mean, why are we even bothering then? It's a doggy it. dog world. You know, I, you, if you don't give me the tool to do this properly, then I won't fucking do it. How about that? Yeah. And then, you know. But it, but it, this. Oh, damn, she's banging the table. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like he needed somebody to do that for <laughs> I him. Did, I did. I, I was. I was oh, he was you. getting there. He needed someone right. to help him out. Right. Um, you know, and again, this is why I feel like EMS is within a rock and a hard place because there's providers like you and me that want to be able to yeah. utilize this, but at the same point, you know, is it worth losing your job? Over? Is it? Right? I don't want to lose my massive fortune over this. You know. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, doctors have a greater liability insurance than we do, so. Well, you know, and it's their license <laughs> on the line as well. Insurance? I don't know. <laughs> you know, but you brought up a good point in that it's their liability insurance that covers our decisions anyway. You know, medical directors. What is it? Yes and no. It's their license. I mean, not their insurance per se, but their licensing, you know. Do you have enough money for a really good lawyer right now? I'm just saying. I'm not saying I'm it's... Play, I'm, I'm playing, playing devil's advocate me over too. here. Me too. I agree with Gerard. I think more people have to come to terms and think, you know, do I want to be giving ketamine, even though it's phenomenal, uh, there are risks involved because of the higher scrutiny right. and the lack of honest caring and giving a fuck <laughs> by EMS administrations. Right. You know, so um, the last thing, like I, I, I kind of alluded to um, dosing. I went out on the interwebs and I found protocol for excited delirium is four IM injections of 250 milligrams of ketamine. What, what, what? Holy Christ. Yeah. If one don't work. BC in the Christ. If one don't work, you can give another. If that don't work, you can give another. Uh, if that don't work, you can give a fourth. And oh, at so that point, start CPR. So it's like cops with Narcan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now, granted, uh. it, it seemed to me that this was a a recent protocol. Like, this it didn't seem out uh, of date or whatever. If, if it is, you guys can comment and tell me I'm wrong. Whatever. I'll correct it. But that's what I found. And- and those are the protocols that will kill people. You know, like, we have, we have 250. Yeah. And that's it. That's it. 250. Isn't that 250 times two, though? What? Isn't it 250 times two? Yeah. I mean. Have you ever not seen 250 work? Like, who is getting 500 of ketamine? That's what I'm saying. I, I've only seen it once, and it was with somebody everybody here knows. And, uh. <laughs> To be no, uh, to be honest, this individual uh, had been smoking crack all day, and was fighting with the four state troopers trying to hold them down, and they were winning. But then at that point, don't you think that ketamine is not the best option? Uh, at that point, it was the only option. They uh, two fifty in the arm, and it did almost nothing. And then the second dose for the full five hundred still took almost ten minutes to work. And then, the thing but, is, but when it did work, it was they, perfect. It was great. If you go and you ask providers out there today, like, what's the onset of ketamine? You would get 10 million different answers. So I'm going to go give that 250, and then I'm going to wait five minutes. I'm going to be like, oh, it doesn't work. Do it again. Like, what, what time frame are we saying it doesn't work that I'm going to give 1,000 milligrams of ketamine? I mean, you're, yeah, I, I you're not that, wrong. 1,000 is way too much. <laughs> that's that's like, way gonna, too much. <laughs> and it doesn't work in the three minutes that it takes me to put my sharp away. I'm going to go give that other one. Like, what time frame are we talking about here? Why does it take three minutes to put a sharp away? She's just saying, it's a procedure. I she's <laughs> There's a checklist. Right. <laughs> or there should be. I don't know be. if you know that's time for everything. <laughs> but, yeah, and especially when, um, you know, the, the, the procedural sedation dosage is, like, for IM is three to five migs per king. Right. That's, I mean, Christ. Mm. Like. He probably wanted some sedation. Seriously. Oh, like bad. you're Oops. giving, you're giving almost double what you would to me in 
excited delirium 250. Yeah. And and you're all you're doing is sedating somebody. Yeah. Who cares? And you know, I think a lot of people go, "Okay, well where's the line for excited delirium and just being crazy?" And I think that's a so conversation that's very- to have a different day cuz that's a whole that's a whole episode by itself, but like really. I would- you know, it's there is that line, and a, a lot of people are like, "Oh, well, they're crazy, excited delirium," because I can give two fifty a ketamine, and I just want them to shut up. But again, yeah, there's between being an asshole and being excited delirium. Right, right. So, in final, guys, do you guys have any, um, you know, final advice or thoughts um, for like Kelsey's new providers that? you know, are learning ketamine or maybe be very hesitant with ketamine right now um, to offer? I'm looking I at mean, Emily. Just think- <laughs> You're looking at Kelly? No, I was looking I'm at Emily. Emily. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, Kelly. <laughs> I just think you need to think it through. I don't think that ketamine, especially today, like in today's age, is something that you're like, oh, ketamine, let's go and give it. You really have to think that through. Think of your dosages, like look at your patient, not – very few people are 100 kilograms. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah. Oh, you just, you got to be smart about it. I agree. I think, you know, as we said, confirm with other people on scene. You know, your, yeah. EM, your EMT can sit there and confirm a they weight. can guess weight. You know, right. you can sit there and have them go, okay, um, I'm going to tell you the dose. It's this. Show them your phone, your protocol app, and yeah. just, hey, can you calculate that I'm given the right one? Uh, they can do that on a calculator, and and that's completely legal. And I'd be like, "Cool, mine confirms yours. Right. My math is but your math. We're good." Be like, "Hey, what do you think they weigh?" And don't be like, "Oh, I think they're 100 kilograms. What do you think?" Yeah, it looks right, right? No, like let them answer because this is legit gonna bite right. you in the ass. Right. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Anything from you guys? No, I mean that, that's that's pretty much it. Like I said, I'm, you know, now with all this litigation out there i uh, i would really think long and hard mm-hmm. and honestly i mean if if the doctors aren't going to give it to us anyway when we call for what it was actually designed for mm-hmm. then maybe we shouldn't even have it just get rid of it because yep. it's just a pain in my ass well i think you're going to find it harder and harder to get orders now with everything going on yeah. as well i agree with that wholeheartedly so I mean, you I thought it was- i haven't called yeah, for ketamine orders since all of the hubbub um, the sad thing is, is it's, it's great. It is. And it should, it's and, phenomenal. And we should be freaking using it, you know, as it should be. But, you know, whatever. But we ought to be using it properly. And even, like, local protocols don't really – they leave a lot for interpretation. Yes. Yeah. And that's where people get jammed up. Yep. Yeah, I think the gray area needs to be more black that's and right. white. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So, good, guys. Um I think we beat ketamine with the dead horse that it was designed for. Um, I feel like <laughs> our discussion in general, though, brought up a lot of things that we overlook in EMS. Just in, <laughs> did you guys hear that? Of course we did. Oh, sorry, guys. As she whacks the sorry. mic. So I was going to say, when you smack the shit out of a microphone, <laughs> everyone's going to hear it. Did you hear that? Even I heard that. No, I was too busy hearing the real-time thud. Fucking Corey heard that. <laughs> yeah, Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got excited, and my hands started flying like I was Italian. Right. Oh, look at that. She's, she's Italianist. Gestation. You know. G- gestation? is yep, No, nope, not it. gestation. Gestation? No, it's that's gestation. pregnancy. Gesticulation, that's what it is. Gesticulation. Wait, what? Gesticulation. Keep going. It's gesticulation. Damn! I'm serious. It's a word we learned at like the tenth grade. Gesticulation. Gesticulation with a G. Oh, for Gerard. Ah. Okay. Now she's banging the table. So I'm gonna use my last sound effect for the day. Uh, <laughs> what is that? She's coming to the dark side. Yep. Oh. Yes. Mm-hmm. Sounded little by little. Weird. Little by little. She's turning into me. Yep. Yep. I have way more of a filter. <laughs> Oh, it's, <laughs> it'll it'll it's pass. crumbling little by little. <laughs> we've we've already seen glimpses of it, especially the last episode. Yes, that was great. Mm-hmm. That's why I put that on the board. Bombs, freaking. That's why I put hose. That's why I put Vader on the board. People hose all the time. You earned the title. You deserve it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> banging the table. Anywho, I feel like just the things that we talked about about ketamine. I feel like overlap a lot about 
the flaws that we have in EMS as a whole. Yeah. Oh, That's what I, I was trying to say, mm-hmm. and it just didn't happen. And I think also flaws in the whole medical control thing, well, at least in this area. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it is everywhere else, but you know, in this area it seems like, you know, yeah, just whoever wants to be a doctor and answer a phone, just here you go, yeah. have a number, and mm-hmm. uh, off you go. So yeah. often do you I think that's only going to get worse. Do you know how our medical directors in our area get their privileges? No. No clue. The head doctor in charge of these baby physicians say, hey, these are the protocols. Are you comfortable with them? Yeah? Cool. Let me email somebody and get you a number. Huh. Nice. Yep. So I'm just saying, like, technically, that's going to get worse because they are throwing people through these processes because they are so short-staffed across the board. Mm. So I think that the worst is yet to come on that. Yay. Things to look forward to, guys. So uh, with that, I'm going to say Happy New Year to everybody. We'll see you on January 15th. Uh, hopefully, Emily, you'll be able to join us in studio here. because Post-COVID. Post-COVID. Um, Post-COVID. <laughs> but with that, uh, it's like, it's Gerard. Like a, it's like a new shitty rapper. You know? it's post-COVID. post-COVID. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> I mean, someone could probably... Make right. a fortune on that. Yeah, why not? Everyone mm-hmm. else is making money off COVID. Why that, not? Why not? <laughs> right. <laughs> Lower. <laughs> Lord. No, I can't be stopped. I'm not. Wait- I'm waiting for you to end with this. End the show. Oh. Um. Yeah. Okay. The 2022 Deuce Deuce Donuts. What? Do you, what? You gotta plug this in. This is your bullshit that makes sense. Ugh. Uh-oh. Okay. P.S. How about it? P.S. <laughs> no, I thought you were just gonna stick it in at the end of your bullshit. You're gonna stick it in in the end of my bullshit. <laughs> if you guys keep saying that, I'm gonna make a stick it in joke. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Emily, your America. Long live the king. <laughs> your America pen is made in Mexico. Okay, so the oh, there's a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> Could be worse. <sighs> so the bullshit blah 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 of chemistry terms that Turk had described to talk about, like what ketamine specifically acts on. So your NM and NMDA receptors control synaptic plasticity, which is the process by which patterns are recognized. So basically, that's your memory and learning functions. Um, really don't know why ketamine acts on that, but um, because it's. It's an anesthetic. You don't want to remember well, going I down that and your memory, but getting a tube in your throat and your um, testiculars chopped off. And mm-hmm. <laughs> it also acts on your opioid receptors, which is pretty self-explanatory. And then your monoaminergic receptors. Um, so those are the receptors that transmit the effects of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. So your happy drugs, and then one of your sympathetic um, nervous system neurotransmitters. And then it also acts on your Yikes. Muscaneric yep. receptors, which are protein receptors involved with the parasympathetic system. So those are like mm-hmm. basically the bra- basic, easy breakdowns. If you've gone through medical school, you should be able to know what any of those are. So oh, that's geez. just the blah <laughs> in easy terms. <laughs> yeah. You know what the parasympathetic system is. You know what the sympathetic system is. And I just told you memory. Cool. And you know what your testiculars are or for I when I they're cut what off. My so. testiculars are. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, no, the, uh, you know, the, like we said earlier, you know, she she needs to find a nerd. Well, that's the kind of stuff that'll that'll, be, that'll land you one. Oh, thanks. All right? Yep. You just keep going down that road. <laughs> yep. Right to the computer lab. <laughs> <laughs> With your energy drink. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I do it. <laughs> Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you'd like more information on the podcast or to send us a call to review, visit medicmaterials.com forward slash podcast. To learn more information, like us on Facebook at Medic Materials EDU or watch our weekly instructional videos on the Medic Materials YouTube channel.